Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. So we are on our way to point and release. Uh, earlier we scheduled it for March second. We are pushing it a little bit into another week. Um, we have quite a bit of stuff coming in, so we want to make sure you know all of that work that is in progress gets shipped as part of point and release. Um, to talk about high level, uh, let me open up my slides if I have. All right, so what are the features that we are shipping at the high level is the data collaboration. So far in point eight, if you have noticed, we ship all the change events as an activity log. Uh, from point nine, you actually can interact a lot of parts of the open metadata and open a thread and have a conversation. For example, you can say that, hey, Harsha updated a description, I want to make a correction, I want to start a thread and kind of have conversation about a table description. Uh, you know, tags that are coming in, policy tags or whatnot. So this will become more into the data collaboration aspect that we started as a foundational aspect um, and kind of move on to, you know, not just the activity threads conversation, but also setting tasks and everything else. So coming to open metadata, you can actually collaborate around your data. Uh, glossary, this is one of the most asked features. We are kind of building glossary as a ground up feature and kind of taking, taking a all new just to spin some all new uh, ideas from glossary and uh, there's there's and all the industry standard that's happening right now into uh, you know what we call as the glossary in open metadata. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well, and then the data quality. Uh, we talked about data quality, data profiling from pretty much the very beginning of the open metadata. Now we are kicking into next gear of data quality, what that means. So we build a profiler from ground up. We kind of keep iterating and making it much, much better. And uh, the idea here is the profiler can be improved for every release and not only make it faster, but add new metrics and everything else. So this is kind of same of you know, what you're seeing. Like you, know, you go to a profile page, you get all the metrics about a table. Uh, but what we are going to do in this release is to actually add a test as well. So you can say that, hey, I'm seeing the row count for a table. I want to make sure this row count for every day should be around at least 100K uh, you know, rows per day. And you can add a test for that. Similarly, you see, let's say, orders. And orders per day in this table should be at least greater than 1,000 and less than 5,000. So you can kind of create tests around the uh, profiling that we are doing. And this is similar to what we're going to happen in great expectations as well. So with great expectations, you have, you know, expect column to be in between. So you're modeling all those tests into open metadata JSON schemas and building the test around that and creating the APIs. Uh, the great thing with this will be you can actually do it um, pretty much everything through the APIs and the UI, and you get the results directly in the UI itself. And you know the next level of things that we built before the change events and everything else, will start generating a when a test case gets failed or you know succeeded or aborted, so that you can consume these events and kind of react to it based on the quality check that you have. So that's uh, kind of a high level features. I have a bunch of connectors that we are doing it and didn't list all of them, but we have around eight plus connectors that's coming in in this release in total forty five plus. Uh, that we have from the beginning and also lineage coverage. Uh, lineage early on is used to be mostly around the airflow. Now we added uh, lineage coverage for superset, Tableau, uh, Metabase, uh, uh, and uh, Vertica, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, all the big items that are coming in that we already have sources, we got the lineage as well. So all the lineage will be published whenever you run the metadata connector itself. So those are the high level items that we have. Um, so we're gonna, Kind of talk about this today and you know, go through some of the work that we have been doing and what you expect in point and release. With that, so if you want to go first, uh, Vivek. You want glossary to be first? Either way, uh, Vivek, you are ready, right? I will so, I will uh, go first. Okay. okay. So glossaries is an exciting feature that we are working on and uh, you know, there are many terms that are used in uh, the world of data, right? There's data dictionary, there's glossary, and then the world of knowledge organization comes in and there is, you know, 
knowledge organization systems, all kinds of terms that are there. So just want to make sure that um, we understand, you know, at least define the term glossary and start using them consistently in our project. So glossaries are a type of controlled vocabulary, right, in an organization, right? And they're typically used for uh, defining concepts um, and defining terminology, right? So concepts such as, you know, um, revenue, things like that. And there could also be terminology such as, you know, who is a customer and, you know, when do we recognize revenue, bookings, things like that. So it is for defining concepts and terminology, and it could be within, you know, specific to organize within a certain domain, right? So maybe finance team in your organization has certain terminologies versus, you know, the development engineering team, maybe, you know, product teams, they all can have their own concepts and terminologies and then establish uh, a clear, you know, list or a hierarchy that everybody can consistently use, right? And these were, you know, these terms become uh, the, the basis for having a consistent understanding, right? And if you don't define the term and people assume, um, you know, so, uh, people have certain meaning in their head when they're using certain terms and then somebody else is understanding it as something else, then you don't have a common understanding. So, uh, so defining all these concepts and terminology is, uh, is, is super important. Uh, also, right, in an organization for a concept or, you know, um, for a terminology, uh, a word can be used, um, <clears throat> different words can be used, right, in different parts of the organization. So establishing a preferred term and then what are the synonyms, near synonyms, related terms is uh, important for understanding the information you have within your organization, right? Um, a lot of uh, organizations are also, you know, worldwide organizations, and so they have people speaking different languages, uh, making sure the terms um, that are there in English are available in other languages through glossary is also important, right? And then glossaries themselves are used for organizing and indexing large volumes of data, information, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then the terms from the glossary can be used for labeling and tagging as an additional metadata for existing data, right? For describing, categorizing, classifying, things like that. Uh, and finally, right, um, the glossaries are super important for discovery of data, for retrieving data and exploring data, right? Through conceptual understanding, right? Uh, conceptual terms. Um, and then all of this helps in governing the data, right? Because you have no classification, categorization, uh, you know, conceptual um, uh, definitions through which you can discover, understand the data and govern the data, right? Um, now, in terms of glossary organization, uh, typically, um, you know, unlike other, um, you know, other uh, uh, things like, you know, dictionary where typically a term can have multiple meanings in glossary, a term has a unique definition, right? Uh, that is super important. You don't want to have too many inconsistent definition for a term. You do, you know you are establishing a unique definition of a term in a glossary, and at the most basic, uh, and this is what you see in a lot of systems. Um, glossary is nothing but a list of terms, uh, typically organized in an alphabetical order, and then you know um, sort of like you know this is a kind of you know organized like an index, right, at the end of a book. Uh, more complicated glossaries that are trying to capture more complicated concepts uh, and relationship are organized in, uh, you know, what we call as either taxonomies, tesori, um, you know, these are sort of like, you know, broad definitions. Taxonomy is focused on uh, not just a flat list, instead, you know, hierarchical list of terms that are used for classifying, right, um, the information you have. Typically, the relationship taxonomy have is parent children, and parent children is essentially, you know, either, you know, um, a term is a broader concept of another term, or a term is a narrower concept of another term, and those kind of stuff. For example, car is a narrower, you know, um, uh, concept of uh, a broader term called a vehicle, and vice versa, right? So, uh, you know, vehicle is the parent of, let's say, car. That is one, you know, way of organizing. Uh, more complicated uh, glossaries use a thesauri kind of an organization. Again, it's a hierarchical list. 
but in addition to parent child relationship it also has equivalent like synonyms and things like that and uh, you also have associative you know uh, concepts so you can say you know uh, maybe there is a car and then car might have related concepts uh, like transportation and traffic management and things like that right so um now, finally, right, when we are using the term control vocabulary, especially in terms of glossaries, a uh, um, couple of ground rules are uh, required to turn it into control vocabulary. One is you should use only the terms from the glossary to describe concepts, right? If you're arbitrarily you know, using terms, and then glossaries are not that helpful. And then you know the standardization that comes out of glossary uh, you are not going to benefit out of that, right? Um, and then the second thing is when you're establishing this controlled vocabulary, there needs to be a control over who um, is the one who can add terms and then who is the person who can accept the terms, how it is added, you know, what is the life cycle of terms, all of those things are super important um, for glossaries, right? Uh, so <clears throat> with that, right, open metadata uses Tesori kind of an organization for building a glossary. So I'll give you a few um, you know, mock-ups that we are working on. So the work in progress in release 0 0.9. Uh, here is how you know, there are different glossaries that are available, right? That um, you, know, you can have you know, from customers, department, those kind of glossaries, um, which are group of terms. Uh, so you can have different uh, glossaries um, that are organized. And then within a glossary, um, there are terms, okay? And you can have terms that have children term, right? So here is an example where in a business glossary, we have a term called customer. Um, and then, you know, for that term, you can have different synonyms that people use. So preferred term is customer, right? Everybody should be using this term customer, but some people might also be using a term called client, shopper, purchaser, uh, either, you know, you know, a more, you know, casually or in other parts of the organization, maybe the terms used for customer could be different. So you want to define preferred term and all the synonyms. And this is super useful right now where you can search data, not only by a precise term called customer, but you can also use a related, you know, terms like client, shopper, purchaser, and then, you know, you can go discover the data and, and, and things like that, right? So, so synonyms. And uh, the other thing is um, status, right? Uh, terms, typically are you know suggested and added and it needs to be accepted upon if you want terms to be standardized you know there needs to be some kind of a review process and you know accepting the terms and so the terms go through a life cycle of you know their draft when they are you know added and then you know they are approved and become active and then you know maybe they get deprecated and then eventually deleted right um, the other thing is terms should have um, reviewers, right? So here are, you know, reviewers within an organization who can review this. Uh, now, in terms of um, open metadata, we one of the things when we talk about collaboration and automation is we want to make some of the heavy processes in the metadata world a lot simpler. So today, reviewing happens in many of the organization where people actually create a, a glossary term and then they create a JIRA ticket, um, you know, and then somebody else has to look at the JIRA ticket and resolve them and all of those things. And um, now here is a you know, thing where, you know, we'll have these reviewers and some micro workflows right in open metadata where when a new term gets added, the reviewers automatically for that, uh, reviewers for that glossary are going to be uh, notified uh, and tasked with accepting them and they can look at all their tasks right in open metadata. Uh, and then, you know, accept the terms or reject the terms and things like that, okay. Uh, and then finally, right, a term must have a clear description, definition, uh, information on when to use it, how to use it, where not to use it, you know, all kinds of information is required. A uh, few things, right, when, you know, I was talking about our glossary, uh, had, you know, borrows uh, our organization from Tesori, uh, we have a concept of children. So here is where customer is a broader concept and the narrower concepts are a new customer, a loyal customer, a former customer, you know, you can add other kinds of things, right? So here the children concept is essentially from a broader term, you're going to a narrower term, right? And there can be other things also, right? Similar concepts and stuff like that, logical concepts. Uh, something is shared between these children, all of these children that is elevated to a higher level broader concept. Right? 
Um, the other thing is related. So for example, let's continue with the example of customer. The related concepts that might be available in your glossary is customer lifetime value, um, you know, this is all, you know, truncated. Uh, customer um, acquisition cost, uh, you know, um, uh, customer retention related information, customer attrition, you know, CRM, all are customer related concepts. So once you go to customer, you can actually discover other concepts and then you can go there, discover, uh, you know, other concepts related to that. So uh, not only that, you can also for every term, um, you know, discover the assets related to them. So here is assets that are um, curated based on the gloss, you know, the glossary terms um, that is at, you know, that is that they are labeled with, right? So here is an example of, you know, looking at all the assets um, that have, you know, let's say clothing in this case, right? Uh, so this is another dimension to how we discover the data, right? So, so far in open metadata, you have discovery through keyword search, right? And then you're essentially looking at where those keywords appear. Is it column name, description, the table name, or the asset name? Uh, two, we went into uh, discovery through association where, um, you know, once you discover the data, you could have, hey, this table is typically joined with other tables is one way of, you know, associating uh, a table with uh, the related tables. So, um, uh, this is another dimension to it right now discovery through concepts right you have concepts that are cataloged in a glossary and then you essentially start with the concept like a customer and then you can look at related concepts and then from the concept you can get at the assets so that's um, the uh, you know advantage of uh, glossaries in terms of discovery and information retrieval so that's uh, um, you know what I wanted to present so any questions so far and by the way, this work is going on in this uh, uh, issue. You can, you know, chime in, look at uh, what is going on and provide your feedback. Any questions? Just a quick one, I think. Um, what's the relationship uh, between tags as they currently exist in open metadata and glossaries? Yeah, so uh, this is something that, uh, you know, um, that, that I have been thinking a lot about. So, um, tags, um, glossaries have a lot more information, right? So they have description, definition, related terms, uh, you know, things like that. And then glossaries themselves can be used as tags, right? Glossaries can be used as labels where, you know, you can use it just like we have tag categories today. So the tag categories that we have is, um, a lot of systems end up having these things called folksonomies and you know free tagging where people end up adding name value pairs as tags and only the person who has added it you know can understand it and then this because you have a lot of users can grow into a large uncontrolled vocabulary uh, can build up right as tags uh, so instead of those folks on we, we we started with tag categories, right? We decided that we will not allow free form tag categories and things like that. And so our tag categories themselves are controlled vocabulary today within open metadata. However, most of these tags are going to be used for classifying and categorization, not for defining conceptual terms and then you know having conceptual relationships. So uh, take business glossary as not only tags in addition they are you know they describe concepts there can be you know uh, 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 they, they, you know there can be additional related terms a lot more richer information that is what we think so tags are uh, simple classification and categorization and since i also use classification and categorization classification is a, uh, is a kind of a tag where only one um tag label from that classification can be used. For example, you cannot have a table as both tier one and tier two. It's either tier one or tier two. So that is what we call as classification tags. Categorization tags, you can have multiple, a table belong to a multiple categories, right? It could belong to customer category and then maybe finance category too, right? So from that perspective, you know, tags and tag tags are for categorization and classification. Um, business glossaries are much more than that, including defining concepts. Yeah. So other thing that we are also exploring is possibly adding um, some way of, uh, you know, extending these things where you can add other fields, right? 
uh, within the glossary and that might be relevant within your organization right for example a concept of a domain or something like that should be easily added through our glossaries any other questions i had two questions uh, there is you mentioned about taxonomy and tesserae and is tesserae uh, superset of taxonomy in your that that, that is uh, um, correct okay. so um, i have i'm writing a blog and you know i'll send it to you guys but essentially right from a controlled vocabulary perspective there is a in you know if you look at from increasing levels of complexity there are control lists right they're just lists list of terms there is no hierarchy nothing all the way to you know, list of terms that have some kind of a relationship. For example, synonyms, right, are a list of terms where, you know, they're equivalent, right? The terms are equivalent. So you take a term and then you say these are, you know, equivalent terms are near equivalent. Uh, and then from there, you, you know, start going towards um, a taxonomy and taxonomy is only about uh, defining a hierarchy, right? Hierarchy within, uh, you know, a set of terms, right? Through some concept, right, that, uh, that they all share. Uh, all the way to now taxon, when you go to thesauri, thesauri is not only like taxonomy and hierarchy, it is also uh, like synonyms, right? Uh, concept is there, um, which is coming from some kind of synonym list, right? Uh, so it is a lot more, um, so it is a superset. And then you also have ontologies, right? So ontologies end up using some kind of a thesauri. But then ontologies also define entities, properties in, you know, of an entity, relationship between them and things like that. From that perspective, essentially our metadata modeling is an ontology, right? It's a defining entities and properties and relationship and using some controlled vocabulary of uh, standardized types and things like that. I see. So that's a, that's a, you know, different uh, levels of organizing controlled vocabulary. Yeah, it's it's pretty good to see that you put a lot of thought into like understanding all of this. And geez, my second question was around the the third tab, the assets. Uh, I suppose yeah. we can pin uh, different parts of the assets to uh, to the glossary. For example, dim address or the dim address and some specific column to a glossary. Do we do we do everything similar to the tags such as propagation and so on? That is correct. So if you look at tags we define tags you know there are tag categories and tag categories have tags right and those tags become available as labels when you are you know applying labels to different data assets different aspects of data assets right uh, so now if you look at uh, search, you know today's tag category within open metadata you can go tag a table you can go tag a column right so different parts of a data asset you can tag um, similar thing uh, is available through business glossary. Business glossary term, the preferred term that we have will become available as a tag, okay? And so tag label. And so you can use that to label different aspects of um, uh, your data asset. A few differences from tag category. Um, in many systems, the glossary term is used only to be uh, to add some kind of a label at a table level, let's say, right, at an entity level. We will support adding label using, you know, business glossary or glossary term, uh, even at the column level. And then the second thing is today's tags are only used as adding, you know, an additional metadata, uh, but they're not used for description. They're not used within description, but we should be able to use business glossary because it's a term that you end up using those words should be you should be able to use it in descriptions and things like that so for example you should be able to say something like uh, in here um um uh, you know in here customer lifetime you know value right um so um you should be able to say in the description customer right the term that you are using is actually a glossary term and then lifetime if you have defined it as a glossary term you should be able to use those things right as part of the description also so those are differences. Make sense? Yes. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Okay. All right. I'll hand it over to Vivek. 
All right. Thank you, Suresh. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so like uh, Harsha mentioned, collaboration is one of the main features that we are going to ship with uh, 0 0.9 release. And uh, this is the epic that we are tracking for collaboration. And this is still the work in progress. And uh, we would be uh, happy to accept any feedback and uh, uh, you know, you're know, welcome to uh, provide your feedback and suggestions to improve uh, the feature. But uh, let me give you high overview High level overview on uh, you know what we are trying to achieve with uh, collaboration so these are the bunch of uh, uh, issues that we have created under this epic let's take a look at uh, some of the wireframes to understand uh, where we are going at um, okay so today we don't have the ability for the users to you know create conversations or comment on a description or ask for a description uh, and and so on um, so the, with this collaboration feature, we are, you know, giving users the ability to be able to ask for a description or uh, create conversations around data entities, uh, like the description of a table or a description of uh, a column in the table, uh, and so on. So we have this concept of uh, threads. So each data entity and uh, its fields can have multiple threads, like we see in this wireframe here. And uh, a thread can have one level of uh, replies, which is called posts. Uh, so it is, you know, similar to Slack. How uh, you know each thread can have one level of replies. So if you see here, we have three threads, and uh, each thread has different number of replies. When you click on uh, any of these uh, number of replies, you get to see all the replies like this. And um, we also have. Uh, been thinking about uh, having this concept of resolving threads so that uh, you know you can only keep the active threads open and move the resolved threads to something like an archival uh, in a different tab so uh, yeah so if someone asks for a description and uh, if another user updates a description then uh, we should be able to resolve that thread and uh, old threads can be seen in the resolved tab something like that and another thing we are also focusing on is uh, posting automated threads based on change events. So today we generate the activity feed in the home page based on change events. Like for example, if someone updates a description here, then that user and uh, the all the related users who follow this entity uh, or the team which is part of this uh, table will be able to see that update in their activity feed. Um, so we are. Uh, trying to get the same experience with uh, threads. So when someone updates a description, we automatically create a thread and post that thread to this uh, particular entity field uh, so that you get uh, the description update here and also in the activity logs. Uh, so we will also introduce a new tab in each of the data entity page, like activity feed, where all the activities related to this particular entity can be seen all at once. And if someone has any questions related to this entity, uh, they will have option to, you know, create a new thread and create new conversations and uh, tag different users, tag different entities, and so on. So that is the high level idea. And uh, this is, uh, since this is still work in progress, I would like to give uh, a sneak peek into how the implementation is coming in the, on the UI side. Uh, but before that, does anyone have any questions on this high level thought process on how we are going with the collaboration feed? So do all of the all of the threads, I see that the um, the threads roll up um, into your activity feed for this entity. Mm -hmm. um, do they also roll up into the activity feed for say every entity that I'm following? Um, so right now in open metadata, I can look at following and see all events that, that pertain to any entity that I'm following, you know, and so I'm kind of wondering if I could use that as an inbox, as a, as a user, could I use it as an inbox for any threads that I might be interested in participating in? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's a good question. And yes, uh, you're right, Shannon. So we, roll up all of these entities that the user follows or the user owns into their uh, homepage. So when the user logs in, they see all that feed and they will have an ability to filter by 
you know, just following entities or uh, user owned entities and, and so on. Um, so let me show a quick uh, preview on that feature here. Yeah, so this is the homepage of the user. And uh, this is where user will see all the activity that happens around the entities that the user follows or uh, owns. And uh, this might look very similar to the activity feed that we have today, which is based on change events. But this, these are all coming from the activity threads that are auto created based on change events, what we see here. And uh, to give you an example, let me just uh, you know, start a conversation by updating a description of any table here. Let's go to fact and order. Let's update this description. All right, so I just updated description of this order ID column, and we have this activity feed here, which automatically posted in a new thread, and uh, the thread will have something like this, where we updated description to this new description. And the users will have ability to reply to this thread with uh, rich markdown support. And all of that, let's... And uh, if there are more replies, they can also click on this view more replies and they will get a nice uh, view of all the conversations in this thread. They will also have ability to post a new comment here. And uh, this also propagates to the activity feed in the homepage. So yeah, so we get the updated description here in the homepage and uh, users will still be able to you know, reply to any of the feed that they see here in the homepage, but uh, we haven't implemented that yet. So it is still work in progress, but they will get the ability to reply from here and uh, you know, click on any of these links and go to the exact activity feed and see all the activities related to that particular entity and, uh, and so on. And uh, this is also not yet implemented where uh, you know, users will be able to create a new thread by, uh, you know, instead of just having this uh, edit icon, we will also include another icon like we saw in the wireframes to be able to start a conversation by uh, asking the owner to update description or asking someone uh, else to update description and so on. And uh, once the description is added, they will be able to resolve threads. So this is this is uh, again you know another basis of uh, collaboration where now people can ask, suggest, edit, right, collaborate with each other in continuously improving the data mm -hmm. within an organization. Yeah, and we will continue to evolve this feature. Um, so your feedback is very welcome on this. So I think uh, that's pretty much it for the demo. If anyone has any questions. We can take it. All right. Uh, Very awesome you want to awesome work, guys. This is coming out nicely. Yeah, thanks. Pei, do you want to go on the profile and the quality side of the work? Can you all see my screen correctly? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we're trying to do with the improved data profiler and the data quality is to actually have all of the essential information of a data asset in the same view, right? So we want to know uh, what's the description of my data asset, what are uh, all, the, all the columns, what's all my data, my queries, and so on and so forth. But now, thank you to the data quality, which will have a new cool tab in here, we will also be able to track the health of all my tables, right? So based on that, we are trying to tackle two main issues that we had right now with the current data profiling approach. The first one was that it was running together with ingest, right? So if we, 
for example, imagine that we have a table that has millions of millions of, of rows, the actual ingestion of all of my metadata and all of my changes and so on, it's actually postponed until all of the profiler and these more expensive operations need to run, right? So the first thing that we have changed now is that our profiler workflows are going to be independent so that we can, for example, schedule uh, metadata ingestion pipelines every 13 minutes, every 15 minutes, whatever, because that is cheap. And maybe we have a database where there are super quick changes that we want to be aware of. And on the other hand, we will be able to also schedule these other more expensive profiling and testing workflows so that maybe we just want them to run once a day or once per week or with uh, any specific frequency. So this will be one of the challenges that we are trying to tackle now. And the other one is actually based on the huge number of connectors that we have, which is something great, but every dialect, every database has its own flavors and has its own specifications, right? So we needed to come up with an approach that allowed us to define a specific metrics in a, as flexible as possible approach so that we want to be able to define, even if it is a simple metric such as the minimum, uh, we want to be able to run it in a, in a safe way in Hive, in Snowflake, in Redshift, in MSSQL. And maybe for example, for the minimum, this is uh, actually not a problem, but if we are thinking about some more specific operations such as the standard deviation, we will be starting to see that there is not a single query that uh, is able to run as a silver bullet everywhere, right? So we also want to be able to have this same flexibility and the same dynamism as part of the code. So based on that, we tried to come up with, a, with an approach here that is also very easily extended, right? Because when we're talking about metrics or when we're talking about tests, there is always this other test. There is always this other case. There is always uh, something super specific that we might want to run uh, just for a table. And we want to be able to actually keep doing improvements and iterations on what we support and also to make the life as easy as possible for any collaborators, right? And that's why we came up with a structure where each of the metrics can be treated as an independent entity. And if we take a look at how they look like, the minimum, for example, can just have a super that simple implementation where we just say, hey, I just want to execute the minimum. But there are going to be other metrics, as we were saying, the standard deviation, that have a tiny bit more involved process. And one library that is helping us a lot into powering all of this is SQL Alchemy, because it comes shipped uh, not only with some like ANSI SQL functionalities, but it also helps us to say, I want to define my own function and I can specify how this specific function gets compiled depending on the dialect that it is going to run on. So for example, if we look now at the standard deviation, we can define our standard deviation class and say the standard deviation is actually a metric that I just want to run on top of quantifiable types. And when we're going to run this, we're going to say by default, I'm going to run this uh, SQL ANSI operation, but I know that MSSQL has its own specific flavor of the standard deviation. So we can use MSSQL syntax here. And this is actually something that gets completely encapsulated into the metric per se, so that I do not need to care anymore on how am I running is, where, how am I running this metric, where am I running it? Like all of the process uh, out from here is going to happen automatically and transparently uh, for for us. So, any questions so far? Cool. 
So that being said, let's take a look at some examples on how this runs. Uh, the actual API definitions, we still have them uh, in the oven. So the results that we're going to see now are not based on the open metadata API sync. That's where we want to go. That's where we're going to show the all the tests and all the results. But what I'm going to show you now is just going to be the results saved on a, on a file. And if we do all of the process, let's start just by ingesting the data, right? So here I have an MSSQL Docker running locally. Um, so this is just the usual workflow definition for, for the metadata ingestion. What am I just finding the service name, the host, and the user name and password. So I can just now run this with a metadata ingest. And it, it's able to run and it's able to get all of these tables. And let's suppose that from all of these that I have just that I have ingested, I'm just interested in running the profile and running the tests in a specific table of them. So if we now take a look at the first iteration on how a profile workflow would look like, so you can see it's pretty, pretty similar as the ingestion workflow. We also support here the table filter pattern and the schema filter pattern, just everything the same. The source configuration is exactly the same as in the ingestion. But here we added a specific processor where so far we are just supporting this ORM profiler, but same as uh, other processors, this is something that can be uh, tuned as we go on. And just by specifying here this processor and just leaving the configuration empty, I will still be able to start running the profiling pipeline. Okay, so in this case, I'm still not going to run any tests, but maybe I'm interested in from time to time updating my profiling metrics for this specific entity. So now we can just fire this up. So we can see the response that this brings follows the same flavor as the ingestion. And we see that we ingested this, this single record and that got passed onto our file sync correctly. So now I can just take a look here at the response, because sorry, I haven't said that, but here in the sync, as I'm using the file sync just for showcase purposes, I'm just specifying where do I want to save all of these results. So now we are just going to take a look at this file and we're going to see all of the metrics that by default get run on top of my table. So we have table metrics or table profiles. So for example, the row number, this is actually something that it's important at a table level, but we also have for each of the columns, specific metrics uh, that we want to run on all of the, in, in all of them. So the average count, the distinct count, minimum, standard deviation, even the histogram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can see how all of this gets automatically parsed in, uh, in all of my types. And for example, the full name, this is a string, right? So for a string, I'm able to get information from the max length and the min length, but not the standard deviation or the sum. Whereas if I go to the one, maybe the ID is not the most interesting one to see, but if I take a look at the H, here the mean length and the max length are not going to get executed because H is an integer. And instead I'm going to compute the standard deviation and the sum. And all of these definitions, all of these specifications on where do I want to run what and how I want to actually make this bridge between the metric definition and the specific dialect information all of this information it gets just coded inside all of this all, all of the metrics definitions 
So we just code it once while it works. We do not need to care anymore. We do not need to keep passing information, keep uh, keeping track on where this is going to run. And if there's any specific issue, any specific upgrade that we need to do, we know where at which point in our code we need to go tackle that. But this is not the end of the, of the story, right? Because this is just talking about profiling. And here we want to show the tests. Okay, so the tests are going to be just validations on top of what my profiler is going to output, right? A metric is not good or wrong. A metric is just something that we compute on top of the values and be the table or be my columns. And that outputs a, a specific result, a specific number, a specific value. And then the tests are the ones that are going to encode the logic and say, this actual result that I'm getting makes sense or not. Okay, so uh, we will be able to define these tests at table level and at column level. Uh, don't pay much attention about this expression because we're just going to remove that and have a specific tests definition. So we are actually working on that. Uh, right now, but a bit the flavor will be will be similar where we are just going to extend our processor configuration and say a list of tables for my tests and a list of column tests specific for each of the columns. So right now uh, we can just say, for example, I want the row number be bigger than something the count number of the name column to be less than, than 100. And I want to, for example, check that my nickname column has absolutely no nodes. So if we now fire this up and we run this new profile comment on the CLI and pass this JSON, we see how it runs, but it's actually failing. And it's failing because it says that this test, the check null count, was expecting a value of zero, but I got a value of nine. But I processed one single record, that is the single table that has all of these tests for it, which are check row number, check name count, and the check null count. And if we now take a look at how all of this can look, we can say that all of my test results are going to be in terms of my table. We checked the row number and that was a true. The test was able to pass because we got that 36 was greater than 10. And at column level for the uh, name column, we see that it also passed because 36 is less than 100, but the nickname check actually failed because I was expecting my null count to be zero, but I got an Okay, so again, this is just uh, for demo purposes to be shown here in the, uh, in the file. But if we take into consideration all of this information, how all of these results can be added up like after each execution, and when we get that at the UA level, it's going to be really, really easy for anyone that's discovering the data to not only get a flavor on what this data means and what specific insights and information we can extract from that, but also if this specific asset is reliable enough or not. Questions, comments, suggestions? This is pretty cool, Pere. So a yeah, couple of things. Words. couple of things when you are doing the profiling you are showing a really cool stuff which is min value right and max value for string you're not not only taking the length but you're also showing a sample uh, data like go to the yeah column nickname for example so it's min this is the min value supposed to be yeah exactly this is the minimum nickname from all the table Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so that's probably not. I think you're swapping the minimum max. Uh, yes, for the strings, it's it's alphabetical. Okay. 
I think there we are swapping the max with min. Min should be the the value. <laughs> Small work. Well, uh, see because leaf. which uh, for the column nickname we are showing min as Johnny B Curry. Uh, that should be thirteen length, whereas max length is thirteen. Anyway, we'll take that later. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, 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 that's not my intention to find out, but I just noticed. But uh, what I was initially want to ask Asha, is... You, like, you couldn't control <laughs> yourself. You, <laughs> no, I just see that. Pointed a bug. <laughs> nice hope. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. During I'm sorry, the demo. That's not my intention. That's no, not my intention. We are only giving you art type version. So, so no, hey, I, this is, this is awesome. But, but what I feel is, eventually, if we have some kind of... Uh, some way of taking any metadata, right? And incorporate that in, that them into these kind of tests, right? Like for example, mean length, max length, all of those things are just metadata, correct? That is compiled through yeah. profiler. You could actually think about like any entity, entities have fields, fields are of two types, scalar and uh, array, right? And you know, uh, you should be able to take any metadata right and then use them in an expression language right and write any test right not, not just for quality tests right you should be able to do all kinds of stuff you I mean it, that expression language can be used for triggering some quality workflows all of those things that would be a cool uh, direction to move but then you know i'm thinking much farther ahead than you know where we need yeah, to yeah but that actually would be pretty cool right and even maybe yeah. run tests on lineage outputs or things like right. that like for example I, I expect this table to have that many children because i know how many dashboards i should have running in tableau or things like that so yeah i think that's a uh, super cool idea right now we are basing this approach in in tables with sql alchemy so just to be able to support uh, all of the all of the connectors but we should be able to actually just keep extending that to some yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, we could eventually go towards a, an expression language surrounding, uh, you know, metadata. And the main advantage of, you know, strongly typing metadata is you know what to expect and what is the form and shape and all of those things, right? So, so um, yeah. So, uh, just an idea. Any other yeah. question? Yeah. So, what I wanted to talk about here is like, can we collect the sample of uh, values like min min values so that users will know hey you know this is how it looks like what are my min or what are the max like a distribution kind of thing showcase some values yeah we we, we could do that right uh, so you're talking about when we check this profiler for each of the specific metrics to get like I don't know 5, 10, 20 rows that match that is specific okay that uh, only for that column, yeah, yeah. Only for that column, okay. Yeah, this is something that uh, that we can try to evolve to. Yeah, yeah, no, immediate. Yeah, for these specific metrics, right? For the mean, mean yeah. length. Correct. Uh, when... Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, any other questions? Hey, Pere, this is looking great. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, I think uh, that concludes what we are doing right now for point nine release. And we are obviously you know, shipping a lot of things and we are super excited about all of these things to come together in the UI as well. And uh, we will have a full demo in our next bi-weekly meeting. Please make sure attend that and you know tell your colleagues and whatnot you'll have. Uh, what we've shown is kind of a step stone and stepping stone and you'll see the full things in action. And I'm sure you know, it'll look much, much uh, uh, cleaner and much better from what we have right now. So thanks everyone for attending. I think that concludes our uh, meeting for today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and um, have a couple or one more minute rather. All right, if nothing else, okay. thanks everyone. All right, thank you. Everyone. Thank you for have the next nice video. Day. Bye. Bye.